The Bible is a miracle book, a record of divine happenings. Beginning with Abraham, all of the major characters of Old Testament history were miracle workers. The purpose of these miracles was to separate the people from dead gods and to convert them to worship the living God. When miracles ended, the people lapsed into the worship of other gods and returned to the true and living God only after another series of astounding miracles. Human beings have not changed. Daisy and I know because for nearly four decades in over 70 nations, we've carried the gospel to millions of people face to face. Multitudes of from 20,000 to over 200,000 people have thronged our meetings and have turned to the Lord because of the miracles they've witnessed. Message number two is titled, Everyone Wants a Miracle. You will understand why human persons long to see the proof of God's power at work in the now. Here is T.L. Osborne. Humanity wants a living God. Men and women crave a miracle. This love of the miraculous is not a mark of ignorance, but rather reveals people's intense desire to reach the unseen God. Men and women want to see God in action. From the beginning, in fact, God's purpose and plan for human persons was that they have supernatural ability. They were created with the aspirations, desires, and demands for supernatural authority. In Genesis 1:28, God said to man and to woman, Subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Some tell us that education will take the place of miracles, that we no longer need the supernatural power of God. However, education does not eliminate the desire for the miraculous in people. One mighty miracle today, in the name of Jesus, is worth more than a lifetime of academic theory. Every real spiritual awakening that has honored Christ and His Word has been confirmed by dynamic miracles. All normal people crave the supernatural. They long to see the manifestation of the power of God. People are willing to put up with extravagances and some fanaticism in order to get a little touch of the supernatural God. Cultured men and women will listen to an uneducated preacher because he or she has faith in the living God. He or she prays and gets the answer. People tell us that we do not need miracles today, that education will take their place. But they reveal their lack of understanding of the nature and of the heart hunger of men and women. People want miracles today as much as they ever did. When they see God's word confirmed by miracles, they know that it's true and they turn to the Lord. The third message of this series is the need for miracles. T.L. continues now. Jesus Christ is as much a miracle worker now as he ever was, and humanity needs his miracle touch now more than ever. Today, there's a great return to the Christ life. He's being allowed to live in us, in his power and in his personal presence. That alone is true Christianity. Our slogan today is, Welcome to the living, miracle-working Christ. Wherever a man or a woman acts on God's word in bold faith, the place will be crowded by throngs of people eager to see Christ's miracle performing power in evidence. Jesus attracted the multitudes by miracles, and wherever they are wrought in his name today, he does the same. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. When we practice Bible preaching, we get Bible results. When we preach as the early church preached, we get the same results, regardless of the area or the country in which we minister. Unnumbered tens of thousands of Buddhists, Shintoists, Hindus, Muslims, fetish worshipers, and followers of other religions have believed on Jesus Christ and turned to Him in our mass crusades in over 70 nations of the world because they saw the proof of His living presence through the miracles which He wrought to confirm the gospel that we preached. Message number four is titled, The Foundation for Miracles. Mr. Osborne will now share about how God's Word produces faith. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Spiritual awakening must begin in the preacher, in the missionary, in the leader, in the speaker. The message must be right or all else is in vain. The preacher, at home or abroad, must be willing to adjust his or her thinking and preaching and actions. Otherwise, spiritual renewal under his or her ministry will never come. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, not by teaching outdated traditions. Jesus told the Pharisees in Mark 7, verse 13, that they were making the Word of God of none effect through their vain traditions. We cannot teach the ideas of modern theology and get Bible results. We cannot use the methods of outdated church traditions and win the non-Christian world to Christ. If you want to reap the fruit of faith, you must sow the seed of faith, which is the word of God according to Luke 8, 11. Jesus said in John 8, 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in Psalms 107, verse 20, the Bible says, God sent his word and it healed them. Young's translation says, he sends his word and heals them. God's promises, according to Proverbs 4, verse 22, are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. God's word is his voice speaking to you personally. Read his promises in the Bible. Accept them as though the Lord were here having a private conversation with you. Do whatever he tells you to do and expect him to do what he says he will do. That is the foundation for real living faith. Believe his promises. Think about them. Hear them in your mind. Speak them with your lips. Act upon them in simple childlike faith, and God will fulfill them in your life by a miracle today, right now. Now Dr. Osborne is ready to share message number five of this series, The Ministry of Miracles. Among the thousands at home and abroad who have been miraculously healed in our crusades, only a small percent of them have been individually prayed for. Most of them have been healed through their own faith, which was produced in their own hearts through the Bible truths that Daisy and I proclaimed from the platform or through the printed page. In over 70 countries during nearly four decades of world ministry, we've discovered that most Christians know about Paul's thorn, or Job's boils, or Timothy's sore stomach, or the teaching of sickness as God's chastisement, or the idea of suffering sickness for the glory of God. But very few can quote a single scripture in the Bible that promises them healing. This is because preachers and missionaries and teachers have not proclaimed these promises. They've not taught God's covenant of healing. His promises that reveal the believer's position of authority over Satan and Satan-made diseases. They've not taught the Christian's throne rights in prayer, Satan's legal and total defeat at Calvary. They failed to teach the believer's true ministry, Christ's bearing of our diseases and of our pains, or our legal right to health and abundant life. Instead, they usually teach excuses for not being healed and reasons for remaining sick. There are many truths of healing clearly and positively taught in the Bible. Without these truths, you have nothing upon which to base your faith for healing. If preachers or missionaries or teachers do not teach these truths, then people cannot know them. And if the people do not know them, then there will be no faith for miracles. And if there's no faith, miracles will not be wrought. If miracles are not wrought, there's nothing to draw unbelievers or non-Christians to hear the gospel, nor to persuade them to believe it. That is why I encourage you today to recognize the indisputable value of miracles. They are a witness of God's power, evidence of the truth of the gospel which Jesus preached. Without miracles, Christianity is no more than another religion. Real Christianity is not a religion. It's a life. It's the only form of worship in which the object worshipped dwells in the heart of the worshiper. 
No Hindu or Shintoist or Buddhist ever claimed that the deity that he or she worshipped dwelled inside of them. That would be sacrilegious for them. Yet, that is precisely the foundation of Christianity. Jesus dwelling in our hearts by faith. Colossians 1.27, Christ living in you. Miracles wrought in the name of Jesus Christ constitute tangible evidence that people can see that proves that Christ is risen from the dead according to the scriptures. If he's risen, he'll do the things he did before he was killed. Miracles are the proof. The sixth message in this series is Miracles as Evidence. In it, Mr. Osborne will share a very vital secret about the miraculous. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. These words were spoken by Jesus Christ to his disciples in answer to their questions, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? He told them to beware of deceivers and of those who claim to be Christ. He said that they would hear of wars, earthquakes, and pestilence, and that some of them would be hated and even killed for his name's sake. And there would be false prophets and that the love of many would wax cold because of abounding iniquity. Then, after all of these signs, he gave them the main sign of his coming. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When over half of the inhabitants of the world have not yet heard the name of Jesus, much less this gospel of the kingdom, we cannot say that this sign has been fulfilled. In Mark chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus said, The gospel must first be published among all nations. When over half of the tribes of the world have not yet had a single portion of the gospel translated into their languages, we cannot say that this has come to pass yet. There's so much to be done, and that's why we're committed to the ministry of world evangelism. The storm clouds of the evening are gathering, and the ripened grain of millions of souls is ready to be reaped. That's why we are taking every measure possible to share the good news. We believe everyone deserves to hear of Christ. The gospel must first be published among all nations. Why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone has heard it once? There's no question about it. God's number one job, the number one opportunity of every church, of each Christian, is the evangelization of the world. That was Christ's final commission. It's the purpose for which he sent forth his disciples. My wife and I have already given nearly four decades to proclaim this mighty gospel in over 70 nations. For years, we've published a ton of gospel literature per day in 132 languages. We've sponsored over 25,000 national preachers as full-time missionaries to their own unreached tribes and villages. They've established over one new self-supporting church per day. Think of it. We've provided millions of books, tens of thousands of crusade sermon tapes, and documentary miracle films around the world, plus our own campaigns. Why? We are committed to reach the world with this good news about Jesus Christ. T.L. Osborne will now explain a truth which is very vital to those who believe in Christ. This message number seven is titled, The Gospel of Miracles. What is this gospel of the kingdom? It's the same gospel that Jesus Christ preached, the same as his disciples preached. When Jesus told his disciples to go forth, he said, as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. With that message, he told them in Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8, to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you've received, freely give. These signs were evidence of the gospel of the kingdom. 
in Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Doing what? Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You see, when Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, he always healed the sick. Luke 11, verse 14. And he was casting out a devil, and it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the people wondered. And Jesus said, in Matthew 12, 28, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Jesus proved that when the gospel of the kingdom is preached, devils are cast out and the sick are healed. It is this gospel of the kingdom, preached in the power of the Spirit of God, confirmed by signs and wonders and miracles, that is bringing to pass the greatest worldwide awareness of the power and living presence of Jesus Christ in history. In the past century, there have been certain countries which have received mighty visitations of the Lord's power. But in recent years, nation after nation is being literally swept by the miraculous demonstration of Jesus Christ in action. Literally, scores of both men and women are now preaching to multitudes, not just in one country, but in almost every nation under the sun which has freedom to proclaim the gospel publicly. God is confirming his word as it is preached with signs and wonders, and a return to faith in God is the result. In one of our recent crusades, a leper was cleansed by a miracle of God. Her hands and feet had degenerated and dropped off, leaving only stubs. Also, she was paralyzed. She crawled on her knees in stubbed hands and begged at the big market gateway. She was instantly cured the first night she attended our crusade. The next day, thousands jammed the streets and the city was in an uproar as Medium Gade walked and ran on her stubbed legs with her flesh clean and pure again, glorifying God publicly. We assisted in having her fitted with special shoes, and the district commissioner wrote to us to tell us that this notable miracle has caused his entire district to know that Jesus Christ is alive today. This is the Gospel with Evidence. In this eighth message, Reverend Osborne will share the disappointing experience which he and Daisy had in India when they were only 20 and 21 years old. This message is Missions and Miracles. In 1945, my wife and I, with our baby boy, sailed to India with a burning desire to share Christ with those in other lands. Though we had no previous experience abroad, we know now that the Holy Spirit was guiding us. Our plan was to immediately engage a national interpreter, build a large but simple palm leaf shelter, conduct big crusades, and establish new churches. If we had done that, success would have been inevitable. But instead, we listened to traditional missionaries. They discredited our plans and insisted that the most important thing for us to do was to study the language. They said we should not expect to accomplish much for the first three years. Our better judgment reacted to this negativism but having had no experience of our own abroad, we tried to convince ourselves that they knew best. Throughout the winter, we sat doing nothing but studying an occasional lesson in Hindustani. Once a week, I went to the little mission and printed on a little blackboard the title of the sermon that the missionary proposed to deliver the following Sunday. There was no vision. The mission was open only once a week at 6 p.m. on Sunday for an hour and a half. The meeting was never attended by more than 10 or 15 persons. We sold some of our belongings for enough money to go to another city where we encountered a similar condition. The doors of the church there were opened at 6 o'clock on Sunday evening when, for a short time, a little group of Christians gathered to go through their usual ceremony. We were engaged to conduct what they called a series of meetings, but were advised against making an invitation for non-Christians to publicly accept Christ. As the missionary explained, we just do things differently here than we do in the States. Finally, on the last night of those meetings, I decided that regardless of their methods, I would give the non-Christians an opportunity to accept Christ. 
At the close of my message, I called for those who wanted to be saved to come forward, to kneel, and to receive the Lord. Eleven Indians, Hindus, immediately responded. They fell on their knees, weeping, and received the Lord Jesus. Upon reaching the missionary's home after the service, his wife was saying, Honey, the meeting tonight has proven that if we preach and act like we do in the States, the same results will follow here. As I recall those experiences in India, I have one major regret. Though I was only 21 years old and had no experience, I regret that I allowed anyone to detour me from the method that God had impressed upon me. The direction he had originally given me would have inevitably brought success. We finally returned to the United States because we realized that under those circumstances, we could never convince the non-Christians that Jesus Christ was alive. We needed miracles to prove his power. So we fasted and prayed for many days. We had seen the masses. We knew that if they were ever to be reached with the gospel in a really effective way, a new breed of messenger must arise. We believed in miracles, but did not know how to bring them about in our ministry. It was clear to us that if the blind could be made to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, and the lepers to be cleansed, we knew that multiplied thousands would believe on the Lord and be saved. But no one seemed to think that way. No one encouraged us. Everyone seemed to be content to relegate miracles to Bible times, while the masses of humanity lived and died without ever hearing a gospel message confirmed by signs, miracles, and wonders. We felt alone, helpless, and defeated. But thank God we didn't surrender. We knew that the real mission of Jesus Christ in the world was a mission of miracles. So we prayed and fasted, and God heard our prayers. Now for message number nine. Mr. Osborne will talk to you about the Jesus of miracles. One morning at six o'clock, Jesus appeared to me. I knew he was alive and had all power. I've shared that formidable experience in detail in our big 500-page documentary book entitled The Gospel, According to T. Ellen Daisy. Shortly after that experience, a man with a powerful miracle ministry came to Portland, Oregon, where we had settled down to pastor a church. Seeing his marvelous ministry, we knew that God would do the same miracles through any man or any woman who would proclaim his simple promises and dare to act upon his written word of power. We determined to be at least two more vessels through which God could manifest his power. As the Lord began to show forth his mighty works in our ministry here in America, the unevangelized masses of other lands began anew to pass before our minds. With Christ's power and evidence, casting out devils and healing the sick, we knew that the non-Christians could be won to him by the masses. Since then, we've ministered abroad as God has directed us in over 70 nations. Unsuccessful missionary procedures have not been observed, nor have the negative ideas of people been allowed to hinder us. Instead, we've done what God had inspired us to do in India. We've engaged interpreters, rolled up our sleeves, and gone to work proclaiming Christ as the Savior and healer of all who will call upon and serve him. Indeed, the results have been staggering and overwhelming. Hundreds of thousands of souls have accepted Christ because they heard and saw the miracles wrought in Jesus' name. Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness. Then shall the end come. Our ministry was revolutionized from the day we learned that Jesus Christ wanted to work with us, just like he had worked with his followers after his resurrection, confirming the word with signs following. In over 70 nations, we have not seen an exception from cultured Europe to primitive New Guinea, from America 
to Africa, from Tanzania to Indonesia. We've constructed our platforms on large fields or parks or in stadiums outside where the people of all religions can assemble freely. We've kept our message simple. We focused on Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. We've told the masses the things that happened to people who came to Jesus Christ in Bible days. We've said, come to him like they came. Believe on him like they believed. Call on him like they called. Cry like they cried and repent like they repented. Pray like they prayed. Act like they acted. And you'll receive like they received. Countless tens of thousands have been saved and healed as a result because the Jesus of miracles has never changed. This is the end of Side One. Please turn your cassette over and continue listening to Dr. Osborne. The people of the kingdom shall be proclaimed to all the world with evidence. This discovery increased the burning conviction in my heart that our ministry today must be a replica of the ministry of Jesus Christ, that anything less is not this gospel with evidence. When John's disciples inquired as to whether or not Jesus was the Christ, in Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5, it says, They were instructed to go and show John again those things which you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. They heard the gospel preached. They saw the blind receive their sight. They saw the lame walk. They saw the miracles. Jesus' message was proclaimed with evidence. His gospel was preached with proof. His preaching was given with demonstration. In Acts chapter 8, Philip went down to the unbelieving city of Samaria, and he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Notice, he preached Christ, and he did it with evidence. His message was as a witness. Miracles testified to Philip's preaching in Samaria. The witness convinced the city. They all gave heed, hearing the message and seeing the miracles. A very large city was affected. It was not enough to hear the message, nor is it enough today. They had to see the miracles, which bore evidence that Philip was preaching the truth. And today, it's the miracles which witness to the true gospel. Message number 11 is titled, The Urgency of Miracles. Here is T.L. to share with you. Always remember, the evidence is essential. Paul testified in Romans chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, that Christ wrought mighty signs and wonders through him by the power of the Spirit of God, which made the Gentiles, or non-Christians, obedient by word and deed. Then in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it tells of our great salvation, which was first spoken by the Lord and was then confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, how? Both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Again, the gospel was with evidence. Their message was with proof. What the world needs are Christians who, like Paul, preach not with enticing words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that the people's faith would not stand in the wisdom of human persons, but in the power of God. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The world is waiting to hear the gospel as a witness. It's time to proclaim the good news with proof, with evidence. Only this gospel of the kingdom, preached as a witness, can be the means of evangelizing the world. 
A Catholic priest attended one of our South American crusades. It was the first time for him to see the message of the gospel confirmed by miracles. He was captivated by the simplicity of it all. In deep repentance for his past sins and unbelief, he fell on his face amongst the people on the field, and he was gloriously born again. He testified before the multitude of 75,000 people in a weeping and trembling voice. He said, when I came to this field, I saw no golden altar and no candlesticks. I saw no professional clergyman. All I saw was an open, crude wooden platform, a Bible, and a preacher of faith. And I saw Jesus Christ working with that preacher, confirming his gospel with power and with miracles. A missionary of a historical church organization said after one of our crusades in his city, more souls have been saved in these three weeks than in 30 years of missions without miracles. The 12th message of this series is The Miracle Witness. You'll be encouraged about the fact of God at work in you. Here's Reverend T.O. I shall never forget when I discovered that the word witness is the same word used in describing the tabernacle of witness for God's people in the wilderness. That's described in Acts chapter 7, verse 44. This tent was called the tabernacle of witness because for 24 hours of every day, God's miraculous power was in evidence there. In the holiest place, there existed perpetually the miraculous presence of Jehovah God. Other nations could build tents like the people of Israel did. They could collect the same materials and use the same metals. But one thing would be missing, the Shekinah glory of God's presence, the miraculous witness of Jehovah. Continually, God was present. His glory was in evidence day and night. It was called the tabernacle of witness. Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. There's that word again. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Now we are Christ's witnesses. We are the tabernacles of witness. God's miraculous power is to be perpetually in evidence in our lives. We bear Holy Ghost testimony now. Having been arrested for bringing healing to a cripple through the power of the Holy Ghost, Peter stood before a court of pious religious dignitaries and declared, We are his witnesses. Others may preach, they may deliver their discourses, but without miracles, the power of real witnessing, the evidence, the proof is not there. Without Holy Ghost power, there will be no miracle evidence. It's one thing to say, I'm a minister, but it's another thing to say, I am his witness. Christianity has always been proclaimed and promulgated by witnesses, confessors, testifiers, by those who have met Jesus Christ and have experienced his love and power in their lives. The early Christians were so powerful and influential that their opposers commanded them not to speak at all or to teach in the name of Jesus. That's in Acts chapter 4 verse 18. But they answered and said in verse 19 and 20, whether it's right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than to God, you can judge. But we cannot but speak the things we have seen and we've heard. That is the miracle witness Daisy and I are giving to our world. That is why the power of the Holy Ghost is in us. We are tabernacles of witness through whom God's power and glory is manifested. That gives proof that Jesus Christ is alive, real, and present in the now. Now you are ready for message number 13, Miracles for Multitudes, Dr. T.L. Osborne. Mark chapter 16, verse 20 says, Christ's followers went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word they preached with signs following. Those were messengers with evidence. Their sermons were demonstrated. 
the gospel preached by them had witness power. They were preachers with proof, full of God, full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost. They were witnesses for Christ. Miracles were commonplace in their ministries. Modern theologians tell us that we can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, yet at the same time, they often discredit the supernatural and deny miracles today. How unfortunate for them and for their listeners that they have not yet tasted the miraculous ministry of Christ for people today. When we arrived in a certain nation, some Protestant missionaries from the United States, unaware of God's miraculous ministry abroad today, began a secret campaign to influence the national pastors, declaring these Osbournes will cause division and confusion. It would have been better if they had never showed up in this city. They worked diligently, going from house to house, trying to prevent this great campaign. Some of the people were influenced by their counsel, but most of the local churches enthusiastically participated in the enormous crusade, and their churches overflowed with hundreds of new converts. As evidence of the gospel, many miracles, signs, and wonders were wrought, causing thousands to accept Christ as their Savior. The Bible is our best example of God's power and demonstration. Wherever those in the early church declared the gospel, Christ confirmed their message with the miraculous. Whether it was Peter in traditional Jerusalem, or Philip in immoral Samaria, or Paul on the pagan island of Melita, the same results always followed. They proclaimed the gospel, and miracles were in evidence, and multitudes believed and were added to the church. In Acts chapter 6, verses 8 and 15, it says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Stephen was a witness. His sermons were demonstrated. His preaching was with power. Message number 14 is titled, Questions About Miracles. Here's Dr. T.L. to pose some vital questions to you and to share some answers. What kind of Bible would we have without Elijah raising the dead and calling down fire from heaven? What kind of Bible would we have without Daniel praying in the lion's den and being unharmed, or without the three Hebrew children being delivered from a fiery furnace? Let me ask you, what kind of gospel would we have without the compassionate Christ healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, and giving sight to the blind? What kind of early church would we have without Peter raising the cripple, then gathering the sick on beds and on couches in the main streets of Jerusalem to be healed? Well, what kind of example would Paul be without healing the sick, commanding the impotent man to arise and casting out the devils from the fortune-telling woman? What kind of commission would we have without Christ's orders to cast out devils in his name and to lay hands on the sick for their recovery? Or without his promise that serpents shall not harm you, nor shall any poisonous drink do you hurt? Take these promises and miracles out of the Bible, and what's left? What kind of preacher do we have today who's opposed to the supernatural in his or her ministry? What kind of preaching do you have without miracles in evidence? What kind of missionary must people of other nations listen to who's against the miraculous today? I urge Christian men and women to an unyielding resolve that the gospel with evidence shall be your message, that you shall go forth and proclaim the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom. You shall be witnesses with proof, and you will reap a harvest of lost souls for Christ as your reward. That's exactly what we have done. That is our mission. According to Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. We've now come to message number 15 in this series. Here is Mr. Osborne to share with you on the subject, Miracles to Shake the World. Acts chapter 4, verses 31 to 33 says, When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they had assembled together. And with the great power of the Holy Ghost, 
gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. These were messengers with power, witnesses with evidence. Acts chapter 5 verses 12 and 14 says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Why were these multitudes added to the Lord? Because of the signs and wonders that were done in Christ's name. The early church operated on one principle, Acts 5, 29. We ought to obey God rather than people. Acts 4, verse 20. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and have heard. They had seen Jesus heal the sick, cast out devils, give sight to the blind, raise the paralytics, bless the poor. They were his witnesses. And they had heard him say, The things which I do shall you do also. Go, heal the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel. As my Father sent me into the world, even so send I you. They had seen his example, and they had heard his orders to do likewise. Therefore they said, We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Thank God that as gospel messengers today, we can have that same testimony and we can minister on that same principle in our generation. It is the witness with evidence that convinces. One demonstration is worth a thousand lectures. One miracle is worth a thousand sermons. All Jerusalem was thrown into a tremendous spiritual awakening when the crippled beggar was healed. Well, We've seen the same thing happen. All the city of Ponce, Puerto Rico, became aware of Christ's power when Juan Santos walked. For 16 years, he had dragged his body on the ground with his hands. This and other miracles convinced the whole city. The entire city of the capital of Guatemala gave heed to what we preached there when the blind, crazy, paralyzed beggar of their streets was instantly healed. He was a witness. His case was evidence of the gospel. The entire city of Nakuru in Kenya acknowledged the power of Jesus Christ when the little boy Simeon, who was born without eyeballs, received a creative miracle. New eyeballs were formed within a few hours, and his sight became normal. Simeon became a witness in Kenya. This gospel of the kingdom was preached as a witness. I've spoken of the pioneers of the early church because they were successful. Whole cities changed. Whole multitudes believed. Whole countries were affected. Acts chapter 19 verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. When the methods of those early Christians met with such response and produced such miraculous results, let us never substitute methods which have never prospered. There's such abundant evidence that the methods of those early Christians, if applied today, will produce the same results as in Bible days. Therefore, let us resolve that since Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we too can proclaim his word with simple faith, and by acting on God's promises, we too can receive the same results in our generation. Fashions change, times change, theories change, Doctrines change, religions change, but this gospel was designed by our master to be proclaimed without alteration or adjustment to every creature, to all nations, unto the end of the world. Dr. Osborne will now speak to you in the 16th message on the subject, Miracles Around the World. I've recorded this as one who knows what it means to proclaim the gospel in simplicity in over 70 nations of the world during nearly four decades of miracle evangelism. Daisy and I are witnesses to the fact that it pays to obey God rather than people. We've felt the pulse beat of suffering humanity around the world and have had the privilege of pointing hundreds of thousands of precious souls to the loving arms of Jesus. We've proven the truth of this statement. There is only one way to evangelize the world before Jesus comes. The only way is to proclaim this gospel with evidence in the power of the Holy Spirit that confirms it with miracles. We are convinced that there exists a yearning in the hearts of every people 
people, regardless of race or color, to know and to serve the God of miracles. Acts chapter 17 verse 26 says, God has made of one blood all nations of people to dwell on all the face of the earth, and they all have the same hunger for the God who confirms his word and who fulfills his promises with signs and miracles and wonders. We've taught the gospel to Hindus, Muslims, Shintoists, Confucius, Animists, Fetishists, and to people of many tribal religions. We've ministered in the cold north and in the deep south, in the traditional east and in the industrialized west. We've proclaimed the good news to the educated and to the illiterate, to the black, the red, the yellow, the brown, and the white. One thing we know, all people of all races, of all countries, of all creeds, have the same hunger for truth. All are ready to accept the Christ of the Gospels and to serve him when they see his word confirmed by signs and wonders. While the modernists and the pious theologians warn people to beware of false prophets and deceivers, millions of souls the world over are turning from traditional religions to serve the living God upon hearing the gospel preached with evidence. Certainly deceivers will come, but that simply underscores the urgent need for the real power of God in demonstration. Those who warn against false miracles should at least produce the real miracles. Moses did, Paul did, Elijah did, Peter did, and we do. God is as faithful today as he ever was. Message number 17 of this series is titled, Miracles for Everybody. Here's TL to tell you why this is true. Romans chapter 10 verses 12 and 13 says, There is no difference between the Jews and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Miracles are for everybody. The gospel is for everyone, all the world, every creature, every nation, whosoever. Everything that Christ died for is available to everyone for whom he died. There are no exceptions with God. If 10,000 sick people hear the gospel of healing, believe it, resist their sickness, and accept Jesus Christ as their personal healer by faith, every one of them will be healed at the same time. Jesus died for everybody. He paid the price for everybody to be able to come to God and to receive his gift of life. That is our message to everybody, to you, today. Now you are ready for message number 18, the best one of all for you. It is titled, Miracles for You. Here's your friend T.L. to help you receive what you desire from God right now. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature includes you. What is the gospel? It's the good news of what Jesus did for every person in his substitutionary death on the cross. He bore your sins so that you do not have to bear them, so that you can be forgiven now. He did that for every person who has committed sin, including you. He bore your diseases so that you do not have to bear them, so that you can be healed now. He did that for every sick person, including you. He bore your pains so that you do not have to bear them, so that you can be relieved now. He did that for every sufferer, including you. Everything Jesus Christ did in his death as our substitute, he did it so that we do not have to do it. That is why miracles are for you. Jesus died so that you can have life. Jesus was sick so that you can have health. Jesus was made sin for you so that you can have his righteousness. Therefore, every blessing he died to provide is for you now. He took your sins and gives you his righteousness now, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He bore your diseases and gives you his health now, according to Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. He carried away your weaknesses and gives you his strength now, according to Matthew 8, verse 17. That is why miracles are for you now. 
He already took your sins. Believe it and be saved now. He already took your diseases. Believe it and be healed now. Everything Christ accomplished at the cross is part of the gospel, part of the good news. It's for every creature right now, and that includes you. This is the gospel that we proclaim with evidence around the world. This is the gospel Jesus Christ confirms with signs and wonders. This is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, according to Romans 1, verse 16. If you are not included, no one can be included. If salvation is not for you, it can be for no one. If healing is not provided for you, it's not for anyone. But all of God's miracles are for you right now. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 says, Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation for you. If you've not accepted Christ by faith or if you need his miracle blessings, now is the time to accept all of the blessings Jesus died to provide. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 12, As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. That includes you right now. The Bible says in Mark 6, verse 56, as many as touched him were made perfectly whole, were made perfectly whole, were made perfectly